The thing is, that at this point in the situation, Jesus' behavior makes a radical departure from what you or I would do. And he took the seven loaves and the fish, and giving thanks, he broke them and started giving them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. So even though the disciples messed up, even though the disciples didn't understand what's going on, even though they didn't take the initiative to at least ask Jesus to do it, if not to think that perhaps God wanted it done no matter what, and they could partake of doing it, in the midst of all of that failure to understand, Jesus still gives them pride of place. He still makes them the ones that the people look to and go, oh, they're the ones giving us lunch. That he still makes it so that the people who get the glory in the midst of the situation are not him sitting up on the side of the mountain breaking the bread, but the disciples themselves. In the same way, even when we don't get it, even when we don't understand and we don't follow God the way that we're supposed to, He still honors us. He still continues to love us and still continues to raise us up, even though we missed it, even though we weren't fixed from our stupidity. He still rises us up and He gives us responsibility that we can handle and elevates us in the eyes of those around us. So he takes the disciples, he gives, them, he gives them the bread, and he goes ahead and he sends them out to the crowd. And then they all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, seven large baskets full. Now I'm thinking if I were Jesus, you remember last time they passed it all out and they collected 12 small lunch baskets worth. Now... After all of the obtuseness and frustration of dealing with the disciples, I think I might have said, okay, I'm making enough bread for everybody but you 12. <laughs> you need to learn something out of this. There needs to be some kind of a sting to the lesson here, so I'm going to make just enough for the crowd, and you will miss that lunch you were looking forward to so much. But Jesus doesn't even do that. You see, last time they finished up and everybody had their own lunch. Except for Jesus. There were 12, not 13 baskets. This time, Jesus says, I'm going to get you those big bushel baskets, and you're going to fill seven of them all the way up to the top. Not only do you have lunch, but you've got the next week worth of bread in that basket for all of us. <laughs> but Jesus goes over and above and beyond and blesses the disciples specifically. Specifically, he puts them in this place of honor. And specifically, he provides for them from the miracle, above and beyond anything they could imagine, anything they could think. They were worried about once they ate this lunch, if they stayed another day out in the desert, then they wouldn't be able to get bread anywhere for themselves. And Jesus answers that problem, that difficulty, so fully that there's nothing left that they need. We know how much we don't quite do what God tells us to do. We know the times we've been moved to make a phone call to fix that relationship, and we haven't been willing to do that. We know the times that the Spirit has nudged our heart to walk across the room and talk with somebody new, and we haven't done it. We know the ways in which we picked a fight with our spouse because we were grumpy and we pretended to ourselves it was about something real, but really it was about somebody who was mean to me at work and I couldn't be mean back to them. But you're here. That we know we have disobeyed God. And unlike every other religion in the world, all the others, they say you disobeyed God, God doesn't like you anymore. God wants you to get away now. And you have to work hard and earn your way back into his good graces. Only in Christianity, only in the face of Jesus, do you see him with a group of men who have failed him time and time and time and time and time again, still loving them, still giving them honor, still providing for their physical needs, and still blessing them over and above and beyond what they need. Sometimes we get frustrated. 
Sometimes we look at our life and our circumstances and we wonder if God's asleep at the wheel. Sometimes we get frustrated because we look at our life and we say, okay, God, I've been bad, but I haven't been that bad. We look at our life and we say, Lord, how did I get from where I was to here? How did that happen? I know I've made some mistakes, but I didn't think they were that big. And we can begin to indict and be angry with and get frustrated with God as if somehow he has been unfair in the way that he deals with us. We see it even in the Bible itself, in the book of Job, where Job's possessions are taken, his children die, he's afflicted with disease. And he says, God, if I could face you in court, you would lose. He says, God, I am frustrated. You're still God. I still trust you. I still believe that you love me. But this is not fair. And then we look at what Jesus does. And sure, Job was right. It's not fair. Jesus isn't about fair. He's about, I love you, and I'm going to provide and do for you, no matter what your reaction has been. It's about, I love you, and I'm going to bless you, no matter whether you get it right or you get it wrong. That I'm not going to let you go and I'm not going to kick you to the side of the curb for having made a mistake. I'm going to hold on to you. And see, that's the thing. Is the disciples, as you read your New Testament, as you read your gospel, they weren't any better before that. And they don't get any better before Jesus dies. After he's raised from the dead, they get a little bit more on board. But even so, Peter, one of the chief among the apostles, has to be rebuked by another one because... He starts getting, you know, a little bit of afraid of public opinion and starts behaving like a Jew again. After he's been eating bacon, he stops eating bacon. And that really doesn't fit very well with the way the scripture goes. But basically speaking, these disciples, they continue to make mistakes. They continue to fail to completely grasp what's going on. And yet Jesus keeps them with them all the way along. It's not only that he feeds them on that day, but he keeps them as the key part of his ministry. That there at the very end is the 12 of them in an upper room with him. Sharing that last moment of intimacy together, that last supper together before Christ's arrest. And you talk about failure among the disciples, what about the cross? What about when Jesus is hanging up on the cross and the only one is there out of the 11 that are left is John, the apostle. Everybody else has run to the four hills, has dug in under a mattress somewhere is hiding from the authorities, and only John is there. And frankly, the only reason he's there is because he is somewhat protected by his family position and the people that he knows. He knows they won't arrest him because of who he's connected to. And yet Jesus not only carries them with him through his ministry, but he builds his church upon them. He builds the future of everything that he was going to make on the disciples, despite their flaws and their difficulties and their stupid screw-ups. Which is the best news in the world for you and for me. Because it means that God can take us in our stupidity and our screw-ups and our brokenness and still create amazing things. That He still creates amazing things in the world of what our church is able to do. He still creates amazing things in our families, solving problems that seem to be impossible. He continues to work through and with us when we do not deserve it. The rest of the passage goes like this. And those who ate were 4,000 men, besides women and children. And sending away the crowds, Jesus got into the boat and came to the region of Megadeth. It reinforces this idea. Jesus goes through this entire situation. He feeds everybody. They pick up the baskets of leftovers. And then Jesus just finishes things. He ends them. He dismisses the crowd. They count noses and find that there's probably 13 to 16,000 people there. One of the funny things about this passage is that there are those out there who, who attempt to say that this and the feeding of the 5,000 is the same. 
that is one passage looked at differently in two places. It doesn't really work because later on in the book of Matthew, in fact, in fact, um, next week, we're going to see a spot where Jesus clearly refers to both the 5,000 and then the 4,000 that are fed, where he himself talks about them as two separate events. Jesus had it as two separate events so he could train the disciples, so they could learn from the first how to do the second, how to understand that God can make these, these ministries of multiplication of resources to meet their needs. In the same way, God takes what we have that doesn't seem like it's enough to do the bill, and he multiplies it and changes it to meet the needs that we have. What this reminds us of, over and over again, about our own situation is that the devil uses our stupidity, uses our not understanding, uses our not catching what God wants us to do. And then we come back with ideas like, where are we going to get bread in this desolate place? One of the things Jesus specialized in in his time here on earth was going to desolate spaces. He went out into the wilderness for 40 days to fast and to pray before he was tempted and then resisted successfully that temptation. We find him withdrawing to lonely places in order to pray and here he withdraws to this lonely place and the crowd comes to him there. And as I think about that, I'm sure it's not unintentional on the part of Christ that so many of his miracles are done not in the midst of the fanfare, in the midst of the city, on the gates of the temple, where everybody would be forced to recognize him. But he goes out into the desolate places and performs these miracles. Now some have said it's because he's hiding his ministry so it won't be over swamp. Some have said that it's because he couldn't do it in those venues because it would be forcing people's will somehow. But I think there's a better answer than that. I think the reason that Jesus picks the desolate places of the world to do his miracles is because so often we find ourselves in the desolate places of our life. I need Jesus when a loved one goes to the hospital. I need Jesus when my career looks like it's spinning in circles and I need to figure out what the next step is. I need Jesus when I lose my job. I need Jesus when I find myself in the hospital from that car crash. I need Jesus when I feel like my friendship of 20 years is drifting apart. That in those moments where we are desperate and we are desolate, we need Christ and we feel that need. When things are going well and things are easy, well, we'll say a couple of prayers and pat him on the head or, you know, kiss his belly or whatever. We're like, okay, well, God, I got my God for today. This is good. But it's in those times when we are desolate and alone and desperate that we need it most. And I think the reason he takes them out into those places to do the miracles is to show us and to remind us that over and over again in the most desolate places of our heart, that's where he works. That he comes to us where we need him and desire him the most, and that's where he works. That in the most impossible relationships that we can never see how they'll be fixed, that's where Jesus works on our life. And he does it even when we're too stupid to figure it out. He does it even when we make the same mistake over and over and over again. That he does it even when we don't do anything to earn him stepping into the midst of it. He still works. He still fixes. He still proclaims. He still changes. And he rescues us from what we've fallen into. From the lies we've learned to believe. From the ways in which we have abandoned him. He rescues us. <laughs> And so, as we look at this, God calls us to respond. He calls us to respond. To look over our life and ask the question, is there something that I've missed that God has been trying to teach me? Do I find myself strangely in the same position again that I was in five months ago and ten months ago and three years ago? Do I find myself feeling as if somebody hit the rewind and the play button on my life again while I wasn't looking? 
Because it's in those moments like that that God's trying to get our attention. Trying to show us the difference of where we need to be versus where we are. Trying to teach us something that will hold on to our hearts and help us to move forward. So, my application, if you will, what I'd like you to do is that when the time comes and we sing together, that you would look at your life. To take a moment and evaluate and think, is there something that feels similar? Is there some piece of deja vu? Is there something God has been saying in my ear and I have been not listening? And invite Him to speak. Ask Him to take the blinders off your eyes and to stop away from your heart so that you are able to learn what He's been trying to teach and move forward in executing it. As we lay our lives open to Christ in this way, He will speak. He will speak to our life. He will show us the next step. And we will know what it's supposed to be. As we go before the Lord together, may Christ open our ears to hear Him. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we come to You today and we need You. We need You to be the one that changes us. We need You to be the one that loves us. We need you to be the one that in the midst of our repeated going back to the same mistake over and over again still loves us, still leads us forward, and never abandons us. Lord God, we thank you for your faithfulness and your love. And we ask that we would be able to understand what you're trying to say to our hearts. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. At this point in the service, we're going to receive our offering. It's an opportunity to give back to God for what God has given us. In doing so, what we do is we support the ministry, the work of our church in reaching the community around us and helping people to grow closer to God. But we also support 10% of any money that comes to the church, goes on to our international mission board, reaching and planting churches across the globe, and our North American mission board, which is working to plant churches here in the United States, all over the country, most especially in those areas that are not already full of churches. So at this point, if the ushers would come forward.
and sing to confess Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. To confess Him as Savior is to say, Lord, you alone can save me from what I've done. I can't fix it myself or rely on good karma or somebody else. Only you, Jesus, can fix that, can make me right with God. And to confess Him as Lord is to confess that He truly is God the Son come down among us in a human body. That He has the authority over our life to tell us what to do and guide us in how to make it happen. If you've already started that relationship with Christ, I would encourage you during your hymn of decision to ask God, what have you been trying to tell me? What have you been saying to me that I have not heard? And to ask him to take this time, this moment, to uncover your ears and to take the blinders off your eyes and make you able to hear and understand what he's trying to say. Let's stand together and let's say it.